There's no question that a high tunnel can extend and enhance your growing season. But what's nearly as effective as a high tunnel but only a fraction of the cost to build? A low tunnel. Sure, I can't really walk inside, but it's a lot cheaper and it's so quick to set up and take down that I can use it at various locations around our gardens. Even though we've got a high tunnel at our disposal these days, I still find reasons to use our low tunnels every season. I'm pretty sure this is the best overall low tunnel design out there. It's strong enough to resist wind and snow loads. It's got adjustable sidewalls so we can easily change the amount of ventilation. And we can assemble everything with parts available at most hardware stores. This fall we're using a low tunnel to extend the season for some fall spinach and kale. So I took the opportunity to film the setup of this low tunnel so that I could share the technique with all of you. After this demonstration you should have no trouble setting up one of these tunnels in your home garden. Here's a look at the process. The setup starts with the placement of the hoops. I found that a hoop spacing of 5 feet works well to support the cover through both heavy winds and snow loads, so I've made that spacing standard practice for us. I always get asked where we get these hoops and the answer is that we make them ourselves. And don't be intimidated by this task at all, in fact I'll do a little hoop bending demonstration for you after we set up the tunnel here. The hoops can usually be pushed into the soil with a good amount of body weight and some rubber gloves to help grip the pipe, but if the soil is ever too firm I can pound a hole first so that the hoops slide into the ground more easily. I also pound in a two foot long stake at each end of the tunnel, which we'll use in a minute to anchor the plastic. We use six mil UV treated poly for all of our outdoor tunnels. Yes, you'll be able to find thinner plastics for less money, but they'll rip easily and if they're not UV treated, they will also disintegrate in the sunlight in a very short period. I'm speaking from experience. Get the good stuff, it's worth it. We cut our low tunnel poly into lengths that are 10 feet longer than the beds we want to cover. This gives us 5 feet of extra length on each end. For example, these beds are 20 feet long, so the sheet of poly is 30 feet long. For a 40 foot long tunnel, the plastic would be 50 feet long. For a 60 foot tunnel, the plastic would be 70 feet long. Simple. The width of our tunnel poly is 10 feet. The exposed length of each hoop is about 8.5 feet, so the 10 foot width of plastic allows a couple of extra inches on either side to make sure it can reach right down to the ground. The plastic is first tied to the end stakes with short lengths of bungee cord. We want to finish tunnel with plastic that is fastened down tightly so that it doesn't flap around in the wind. And it's easiest to accomplish that goal by getting a good amount of tension in the plastic right now when I'm first tying these ends. So I'll often re-tie one of the ends to make sure the plastic is nice and snug. At this point, things look almost finished and you might be tempted to stop here, but we still have no way to adjust the amount of ventilation and any gust of wind could easily get under the plastic and cause problems. That's why we've employed bungee cords to keep things extra secure. I tie 12 foot lengths of bungee cord into loops so I can hook the cord into carabiners at the base of each hoop. These bungee cord loops press the poly downward on each side of the metal hoops and this holds the poly firmly in place whether it's pressed all the way down to the ground or lifted up into the air to allow for full or partial ventilation. You'll see a lot of other growers cut excessively large pieces of poly for their tunnels, then use bricks or sandbags to hold the poly down around the edges, but that method requires you to constantly be shuffling weights around and the sidewalls of the tunnel can't be adjusted at all for ventilation. Plus all the sandbags and extra plastic just look sloppy in my opinion and I like to keep things neat and tidy. That brings us to our final product, a strong, cozy, and easily adjustable tunnel that will help us stretch our growing season to the max. Now, I promised you a hoop bending demonstration, so let's head back to our yard to show you how you can make these hoops yourself. All right, let's bend some hoops. I wanted to make sure to include this demonstration in the video because a lot of people see my low tunnels in our gardens and either say something like, oh, I could never build hoops like that, or where do you get those hoops? And the answer is we can do this all ourselves right in our backyard. All that we need to do this is a form to do the bending for us. The raw material to start with, which is just half inch electrical conduit, this is just galvanized pipe. These come in 10 foot lengths in most hardware stores. And we'll need a couple of clamps 
to hold the form down for us. Let's bend this pipe as an example here and then we'll talk about how to make one of these jigs at home. So in order to keep this jig from sliding around, we're just going to clamp it down firmly here. We want to clamp our jig to a flat surface <clears throat> with space on either side because our hoop will be sliding through this small space and extending beyond. We're going to start by just inserting the end tip there and then proceed to pull back on the pipe. So here we go. Just kidding, it's easy. You could do it with one finger. This is so easy. Okay, then after we got a bend all the way, we'll pass it through a little bit more. A little bit more. Now, notice what's happening with my end there. It can either start to rotate upward, like this, or it can go down and touch the table. And if I start to get bending on a separate axis like that, my hoop's gonna be pretty wonky when it is finished. So I wanna make sure that I'm keeping an eye on the distance here between the pipe and the table. And if I keep the pipe parallel with the table surface, I'll end up with a nice straight hoop. So here we go with a little bit more. You never want to bend too far past this end corner so we don't have any rough corners in our pipe. See there, the, the pipe's resting on the, the table at the far side. I want to make sure I roll it up a little bit before I bend. Or put a spacer in there if you're not capable of rotating the pipe a little bit. Now as I get close to the end here, the last couple of bends require more force because my leverage has decreased now that we only have two feet remaining. So what's nice to have for this last portion is some kind of extension. So a pipe like this that inserts over the end will really help you magnify your leverage and finish off the last couple of bends here. So let's just do that now. This might be our last one. Now that's really easy to bend thanks to my extension pipe here. Uh, I think I could go a little bit further still. So let's... <clears throat> it's nice to continue this bending right to the end because these are the parts that are going to shove into the ground and it's a lot easier to shove them into the ground if they're driving perpendicular into the soil rather than sp spreading out to the side. So there's our finished hoop, six feet in diameter, and this will span two of our 30 inch beds very nicely, allowing for a one foot wide walkway down the middle of those two beds. So this is what you saw me using in our Boulevard demo. And if we look straight on, you can see that it doesn't have any warping to it because we were making sure to keep the, the pipe parallel with the table surface. Hopefully after that short demo, it's clear to you that this is totally easy as long as you have yourself a little jig like this and a flat surface. So let's talk about how to whip up one of these quickly. I made this just with a, a sheet of plywood that we had lying around. You could do it different ways. The key elements are that you've got the correct curvature on this forming curve right here. And since we're making a hoop with a diameter of six feet, the radius for this curve needs to be three feet. So all I did to measure this was start with a blank sheet of plywood, pop an nail in, mark a radius of three feet from the nail, tie some twine around a marker, and adjust that just so, so it lines up with my three foot distance, tie a quick knot, and we are ready to draw an arc. That has a three foot radius that could extend as long as you want. 
I wouldn't build a synchrotron with that arc, but it's perfectly good for whipping up some low tunnel hoops. Then I'd cut it out with a jigsaw or a handsaw and you're ready to go. Once I had this top piece cut, I screwed it down to a backer board so that I could mount a separate piece of blocking on the end, which would serve to hold my pipe in place as I bent it. I'm sure you can think of other ways to do this without a backer board. For example, I could just have a three quarter inch sheet of plywood and a short piece of strapping like that that would hold the pipe in place as well. If I screw that down firmly on both sides, that could allow me to make a form that doesn't even have a backer board. And I could just clamp this curved piece down to any flat surface and I'd be good to go like that as well. So, so easy. A form like this sells for one to $200, depending on which market you're in. There's no reason you should be spending that kind of money to, to make a simple jig like this to bend your own hoops. And if you want your hoops to have a different diameter than ours, just make a jig with a different radius. With that out of the way, there's one final addition that we make to our hoops before we head out to the field. Okay, <laughs> and that is to add these carabiners so that we can clamp down our bungee cords really firmly right to the base of our hoops. These are just really cheap aluminum carabiners and a small hose clamp to mount it to the conduit. So we'll slide that on together. I just space these nine inches from the base of our hoops so that we've got room for the pipes to penetrate into the ground. There, now the bungee cord can come down, tuck in there securely, and it's not going anywhere. We'll do that to the other side as well. And there's our finished hoop. Let's head back out to the field. So now you've got everything you need to grow vegetables all year round, right? Well, not necessarily. Tunnels like these can trap heat energy, but they can't generate their own heat energy. So if you're growing in a cold zone three climate like us, even the hardiest vegetable crops are eventually going to freeze solid. There are limits. Where are those limits exactly? Well, I'm tempted to give you some ballpark estimates based on my experience using these tunnels over the last decade, but I'd really prefer to give you some concrete data. So what I'm gonna do here is suspend one of these temperature sensors inside the tunnel. It'll log the internal temperature for the next couple of months, and we'll be able to compare that with the outdoor temperature over the same period. And this data will show us how much warmer it gets inside the tunnel when the sun is out, like today, and how much frost protection these tunnels have on the coldest nights. When all that data collection is wrapped up, I'll share everything on my website so we can all learn from this together. And I'll be sure to add a link to that post in the video description below once it's ready. So that's where we'll leave things for today. If you've already got some first-hand experience extending your own growing season with floating row covers, low tunnels, high tunnels, or even greenhouses, leave a comment below and let us know how it's going. What growing zone are you in and how far into the winter have you been able to extend your growing season? See you in the next one.